Okay, greetings and welcome to another Grand Film Media Watch update. Today's edition I want to call Year Two. So, uh, where do we start? Ah, institutional indifference. This is a new term that's been banded around to try and explain the kind of attitudes that the politicians had towards the Grenfell community before the massacre. Uh, it was coined by uh, Doreen Lawrence. And I think one of the best examples of that was Theresa May's uh, initial response when the following day she actually didn't actually go to see the community who were bereaved, but actually went to take photo opportunities with the emergency services. Now, to her credit, she's actually gone around the media circuit apologising, making it clear that her response wasn't good enough. And her PR department has done a fantastic job, it must be said, on rehabilitating her, her image on this issue. Probably because the Prime Minister knew that the world's eyes were on her. And people wanted to see if she reverted back to what they call Maybot mode. Now, yesterday I saw the restart of inquiry, which is now in its fifth week. And uh, one of the things that's come out is the fact that prior to its refurbishment in 2012, the entirety of the external wall of Grenfell was non combustible. But we've got to be careful there because what the other reports are also showing is that there was a catastrophic failure on all levels that contributed to the disaster that took place that evening. But one of the most significant testimonies that we witnessed was that was the fire brigade incident commander. Um, gone on one. And he admitted that um, he hadn't carried out the required checks on Grenfell before the fire took place. In fact, this is even worse than that because what we also found out is that three years before Grenfell took place, all the fire authorities were officially advised to train up their key personnel to make sure they knew how to handle a tower block fire and more specifically when to abandon the stay put policy. Would, do you think you were, would be able to identify a cladding fire if you saw one? No. We also learnt there was no statutory provision for um, the evacuation of people who were, had disabilities or the elderly in case of such a disaster. Did you investigate whether there were any elderly people within the block who might need help getting out? No. And what about people with mobility challenges or, or children? Not far, I can remember, no. So, what have the media been up to over the last few weeks? Well, I never thought the words would come out of my mouth, but the BBC did actually a pretty good documentary on Grenfell on its anniversary. Um, sensitive, informative, accurate, humanising. Um, job well done. I think many of us forget how difficult it must be to grieve in public, because that's what essentially the Grenfell community has been forced to do. Year-long grieving. The artist Lily Allen made an interesting contribution by talking about how the community is being gaslighted. And I think she's right. But whilst I'm focusing on media, I can't fail to discuss the hatchet dog done by Andrew O'Hagan for the London Review of Books. And this is his piece in Grenfell where he betrayed the community, uh, wrote in staunch defence of the council, and uh, called everybody who was a campaigner or an activist supporting the community some kind of agitator. But thankfully, there's been a brilliant response in the form of a poem by Potent Whisper. So I don't really have to say much other than you'll never edit Grenfell. And it's testament to his whole attitude when this subject deserves every respect. Just look at the way he attacks Grenfell Action Group and other heroes who tried to save their friends. He describes Ed and Francis from Grenfell Action Group as committed local agitators. Wow. I mean, wow. So now, apparently, not wanting to die makes you an agitator. If you're trying to save your life, that makes you an agitator. Begging for help, agitator. Sending letters as well, agitator. Anyone who won't be ignored, they call an agitator. One of the things the Grenfell Action Group requested was a justified independent review. If the TMO and council had properly addressed it, then the things that caused the deaths would have come into view. So, if we were to still leave the campaign for justice, well, we know that the cladding replacement costs are going to come from the Affordable Homes Programme. 
And I think we have to challenge this approach where the government uses sleight of hand to ensure that we continue to pay for our own justice, that we are impoverished by paying for our own justice. Um, the comments made by Ed Darfin are right on the money. Someone has to be prosecuted, someone has to go to jail. As a result of an FOI looking into the communications of the council when it was run by Paget Brown at the heights of the disaster, we now know that Paget Brown and his chums were looking at the North Kensington uh, community not as residents or people in need of help, but as gangs. That was the language that they used. I kid you not. And when the Grenfell Media Watch team issued an FOI scrutinising Southwark Council trying to find out what happened after Lackanore House, I mean, there were fines of almost half a million pound that were paid out. Where did that money come from? Well, we finally got our response. It came from the housing revenue account. That's right, the rent. So justice has to be clearly defined. So one year on, where are we? Well, we now know that the physical Grenfell has actually now been covered up and uh, some really smart thinking has made that a symbol of justice. I love the heart. Kind of reminds me of the bat logo shunned across Gotham. Nobody can forget. Well done to everyone involved in the decision that made sure that sign went up there. We also know one year on that there still remains a huge amount of national support as uh, evidenced by the huge turnouts on the anniversary silent walk. No, people are still calling for justice. But now is not the time to be complacent. Out of the 203 households, 117 are still living in emergency or temporary accommodation. So, where does that leave us? Um, well, I think of this in terms of a new business. And when you're starting a new business, the first three years are often said to be the most crucial. We're just past year one. And so now as we go into year two, you've got to keep your eye on the ball. This is when it gets really difficult. Now this inquiry is going to drip feed every single day on the news. And we're going to hear things that we've already heard and it's going to get tiring. And for some people, it's going to get pretty boring. But that's the process of justice. I learned like with the Rashawn Charles case, what happens is that the state tends to long these things out slowly on and on until people get disheartened and they finally move on. But of course for the families, for those who loved and who lost loved ones, there is no such moving on until justice takes place. For those people who are living in tower blocks and whose lives are at risk every single day and who are fearful every time there's a news report about a fire in a tower block thinking, could they be next? We can't move on. So I think I'm gonna say um, my usual and uh, it's good being back. Many ancestors continue to guide and protect us. Asher.